surging is a pretty big deal. I mean, it's something that we need to do really often, and it kind of needs to happen really quickly. Last time we looked at an old log and solution to searching, of course that is subject to having a list that is already sorted, but the question is can we do better? You're watching episode 3 of Search Algorithms, Hashing. Hello and welcome back to Search Algorithms. So our challenge today is, can we perform searching in O1? Yep, we're actually going to attempt to search in constant time. Disclaimer, I'm actually talking about the average case time complex D here, but it is indeed possible. To do that, we're going to have to perform what is known as hashing. So what is a hash and how does it work? Well, this is actually pretty innovative, so let us actually jump straight into seeing how we actually do things with a hash table. The idea is this, what we have here is a hash table. Essentially, it is just a blank array like you normally would have, except we know its size and we initialize it to a pretty significant size. So let's say I want to insert a new item into this hash table. I don't simply insert the new item at the top. Instead, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take my new piece of data and actually put it through what is called a hash function. Simply put, what the hash function does is it takes the incoming data and does some mathematical calculations to that. The hash function produces a number. This number is in fact the position in which we're supposed to insert the new item. So what we're going to do to make things clearer is instead of working with numbers like we did in the past two episodes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually attempt to search through letters instead. So single letters from A to Z. The hash function I'm going to use in this example is a very simple one. A being the first letter is going to be 1 and B is going to be 2 and so on until Z which is 26. Recall that a hash function works by returning a position. That is where you should insert the new item. So you see, let's say I wanted to insert C into the list. What's going to happen is the hash function is going to tell me 3, seeing as that C is the third alphabet, it's going to give me 3. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it into the third position in the hash table. So this is exactly what the hash table looks like. Say I want to insert the letter E right now. Well, I just give that to the hash function and there it goes into position 5. Now in this series, what we're primarily concerned with is searching. So let us now attempt to search this hash table. Let's say now I wanted to find out whereabouts E is in that array. Instead of actually searching through the array or actually you know, attempting some sort and binary search, what I can do is I can simply tell the hash function, hey, where is the position E? The hash function will tell me 5. I'm going to go to the fifth position in hash table and there you go, that's E right there. Now, how about a situation whereby we actually search for something that doesn't exist? I'm going to tell the hash function, hey, where's the position of B? And it's going to tell me, oh, it's at position 2. I'm going to go to position 2 of the hash table and realize it's empty. As a result, I can be sure that B isn't actually in the list. And as a result, I will return a not found. That's all well and good. That's really simple, right? Well, in reality, hash tables are a little bit more complicated than this. Now, since we're working with simplified examples, what I'm doing here is just using, you know, a very simplistic kind of hash function. It's going to be extremely impractical if we did things like this in, you know, practical situations. But just bear with me, I'm doing this for the purposes of demonstration. So alright, now my input can be strings of any length. However, my hash function stays the same. It's just going to look at the first letter of whatever that's coming in, and it's going to you know, just give you the position based on that first letter. Now, watch what happens. Let's say now, I insert the word cat. It looks at the first letter, that is C, and tells me, hey, it's going to go to position 3. Now, let's say I want to insert the word camera. Where does that go? The hash function also tells you to bring that to position 3. But position 3 is already occupied. This is called a hash collision. Broadly speaking, a hash collision happens when a hash function points a new item to a slot that is already occupied. So how do we deal with this? When a hash collision happens, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to invoke a completely different set of logic to find a new position for this item. 
Now, handling hash collisions is an art in and of itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm only going to cover one very basic method of attempting to resolve a hash collision. This isn't the best method, but just for the purposes of demonstration in this episode, we're just going to stick with that. So what I'm going to do in this particular case is every time there is a hash collision, I'm just going to keep going down in the hash table until I find an empty slot. So if we have cat in this position and I want to insert camera, which is mapped to the same position, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move down. Position 4 is empty, so I'm going to insert the word camera there. Alright, that's a problem solved. But wait, that just creates another problem. If I want to insert the word dog right now, it's going to try to go to position 4 and it's going to say, hey, there's a camera in that place. So it's going to have to move down and it's going to occupy slot number 5 which incidentally is the slot for any word starting with the letter E. But once again, I don't want to go too deep into the specifics behind actual hashing. I'm more interested in the searching aspect. So now what happens if I want to search for camera? I'm going to go to the hash function. The hash function is going to tell me position 3. I'm going to go to position 3 and say, well, that doesn't look like a camera. But this is not enough to tell me that the word camera is not found. What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to apply the same logic as that of hash collision. We're going to have to keep going down to see if perhaps during insertion collisions have occurred to make it, you know, difficult to find. I move down by one slot and I realize, hey, that's where it is. What happens when you search for an item that is missing? Let's try to search for conflicts. The hash function points you to position 3 and you say, nope, that is not what I'm looking for. You try to go down to position 4, that's not what I'm looking for either. You go down to position 5, nope, that's not it. You go down to position 6 and you say, hey, that's an empty slot. Only then can you conclude that the item is not found. Alright, so now that we've looked at that example, let us now come back and try to consolidate what we've seen so far. Firstly, yes, searching with a hash table can be very fast. Depending on a plethora of different factors like how well the hash function is written, what size is the hash table, and what kind of input data do you normally get? In the average case, when you try to search for something, it should be found very quickly. However, if conditions aren't favorable, what's going to happen is things can start getting slow. When there are a lot of collisions and you have to keep doing collision detection logic, what's going to happen is every time you perform a search, you're going to have to go through multiple elements in the table before you can come to your conclusion. In fact, the worst case comes about when the entire table is filled. When you perform a search in the worst case, what's going to happen is, well, it's just going to go through everything in the entire table. What this means is, unfortunately, the worst case time complexity for a hash algorithm is O n. However, fingers crossed, this doesn't happen very often. And as a result, I want to emphasize that hashing has the average case time complexity of O 1. That is constant time. Now, do bear in mind that the O 1 time complexity doesn't mean that I can find things in one step. It just means that I can find something in a constant number of steps. That is, a number of steps not bound or determined by the number of items in the list. So despite its shortcomings, hashing is actually used very often. Many practical implementations of hashing actually allow for, say, a hash table to expand when needed. Hash functions can also be dynamically generated to actually, you know, work best for the input data that's there. And what happens is you get optimal performance. Hashing is also a great way of mapping one data type to another. But that is not a feature that we are really going to discuss in depth today. And that is it. That is pretty much all I have for this particular episode as well as this entire series. I know I've only covered three different types of search algorithms and most of them have pretty serious shortcomings. But hey, that's how it is. Now, if we want to perform even more different types of complicated searches, we might have to look at more complicated structures like, you know, graphs, things like that, which I'm not very comfortable with covering just yet. So as a result, if that happens, there'll be a thing for the future. Hopefully, what I've covered so far is at least a primer for you to understand some of the more basic ways of performing searches. So yeah, simply put, I hope I've been a help. If you have any comments, queries, or suggestions, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. Don't forget to check out the official Twitter account for the channel at twitter.com slash 0612tv. As always, I appreciate every like, favorite, and subscription you give me. But until next time, you're watching 0612tv.